And now, please welcome President and CEO of Hilton, Chris Nassetta, in conversation with Skipped Senior Hospitality Editor, Sean O'Neill. I, I was saying to Rafat and Sean, I love this event. It's my favorite thing to do every year. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're really grateful. I, I always love sitting. You bring these potato chip chairs everywhere you go. So <laughs> I think I sat in these same chairs at uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center, at the TWA Hotel. Yeah, they're nice. The potato chairs, you like the, them? Yeah, yeah, I like potato chips too. Yeah. That's what it reminds me of. <laughs> yes, anyway, great to be here. Thank great you, to be thank here. You. Um, uh, we're, we're taking audience questions, so if you want to use the app, we'll get to them at the end. Well, you didn't tell me that. Ah, uh, surprise. Oh, sorry, good, surprise. I like Not the audience. first surprise. I like audience participation. How's everybody doing today? Good, got energy. Did they open the bar yet? <laughs> no, I tried, I tried to do you a solid. I said, listen, if you want me to talk at five o'clock, you need to open the bar at four, right? Because <laughs> it's late in the day. People get tired late in the day. You gotta get them engaged. <laughs> Well, on that point, I guess I'd start, you know, earlier uh, this month, Delta Airlines said they wanted to have a new uh, strategic officer. They chose <laughs> De Tom Brady, the footballer. And I'm wondering whether Hilton is considering hiring a strategic advisor, maybe Taylor Swift or Beyonce or? We, we uh, you know, Ed Bastian's a friend of mine and I watched him on CNBC. I texted him afterwards because um, he didn't get a lot of airtime on CNBC. Did you see that, Ed? I'm sorry if you're watching, the, you know, this uh, live stream or you're the recording, but it, it was like all Tom Brady. Nobody was <laughs> interested in any way, uh, which made sense to me. You know, Ed's a good-looking guy, but Tom's a lot better looking and uh, has, has some pretty good, has some pretty good rap with him too. Um, but we already we have our own um, celebrity strategic advisor in Paris Hilton. Yeah, uh, Paris is, you know, it's a long story, obviously. We share a name um, for many years. You know, the family, when they sold the business, when I came in, it was a public company. The family owned a big chunk of it. Paris didn't own any of it, but the foundation did. Um, so the, the Hilton family has not been involved in the ownership of the business for a long, long time. But we share a name. Paris is a unbelievably thoughtful, uh, intelligent, engaging, and popular person who happens to not only have our name, but love Hilton and stays in Hilton. She grew up in Hilton hotels, all of our brands. She stays in them all of the time. And so like five or six years ago, I said to my team, like, this is crazy. I had met Paris a few times and I said, this is sort of crazy. Like she's popular, she's young, you know, she's part of this pop culture, I mean, she started a lot of the influencer thing. If yes, you go way back, I yes, mean, I think Kim Kardashian and them were all sort of on the heels right. of Paris Hilton. I said, so why, why would we not uh, lean into that? And so like five years ago, we started, we, she did become, I wouldn't say, you know, a, technically a strategic advisor, but she's become that. She does a whole bunch of stuff with us. You see her in some of our campaigns that we do in social and on, you know, uh, on TV and she works with us on a bunch of our lifestyle brands on sort of helping give us advice. She connects us to her whole ecosystem of people and she's a lot of fun. Example in point, um, literally last Friday, I had dinner with her last Thursday night. She was in town and she said, I'd like to have dinner. She was in town because she agreed to come join me for a town hall at our global headquarters. Very cool. And she was there and people, like our people, like everybody just happened to love Paris Hilton. So I literally had Paris Hilton flipping burgers with me <laughs> last Friday afternoon <laughs> after the town hall out on our patio. That is awesome. So she not only does ads and DJs for us and advises us on lifestyle, but she flips burgers. At, <laughs> she flips burgers at the Hilton World Headquarters. That's awesome. I love that story. So we, we, you know, Tom's a nice guy. No, Tom, he's a fabulous guy, but we got our, we got our, we got your own. We got our own. All right. Uh, so I'd like to start with a couple of big picture questions and then get into Hilton uh, strategy. Um, so earlier this year, you became the chairperson of uh, U.S. Travel. 
And we'll be hearing later at Skiff Global Forum from the CEO of... Uh, yeah, Jeff's here tomorrow, Jeff's right? here tomorrow. Yeah, He'll get into the details on the agenda. So. No, I'm going to steal all of his thunder. Well, if you'd like to, I you told him, no, you I'm like. kidding. I won't, <laughs> I won't do that. What would you say is the scale and impact of the travel industry? Well, the scale of it, I mean, many people don't know this. I also chaired, I'll talk about US travel, but I chaired the World Travel and Tourism Council for three and a half, four years. Um, uh, and the US travel has a similar sort of objective, which is in the case of US travel, to increase travel to and within the United States, recognizing that it is a huge driver of economic growth. It is a, you know, a high single digit percentage when you take the whole ecosystem of GDP, both here in the US and around the world. Similar percentage in terms of employment. Um, one of the fastest growings, like one in like five new jobs ha in the world has been in hospitality and, and huge, uh, travel huge and impact. tourism. And, and similar here in the United States. So the, you know, this is a very impactful business as those of you who participate in it know. I mean, I would say the reason I, you know, I've been involved in whether it was WTTC or now US travel, and while we've, you know, we've certainly made a lot of progress, if I go back in the long history I have in the industry, nobody understands that, right? And so like when you talk, you know, like because all the oxygen gets sucked out of the room with whatever it is, technology, sharing economy, private equity. And so people don't think about travel and tourism as not only a big, business and a big employer, but a very fast growing business. And I'm not just saying coming out of COVID, I'm saying before COVID globally, travel and tourism was, was one of the fastest growing industries on earth. So that's a, a, a wind up to like the primary thing that we are trying to do um, is obviously increase travel to and within the United States. The first part of that job, which Jeff spends a huge amount of time on, and you'll hear about it, and I spent a lot of time with him on that, is building credibility. So like in the end, we're advocating for the industry to make changes largely through the federal government, but also state and local governments to make the system work. And if people don't understand how important and impactful we are, then it's not, you can't be as effective. I used to say like 20, I'm looking at the age of the crowd, sorry, I'm gonna show my age, but 20 years ago, we were like the Rodney Dangerfield of industries, right? I get no respect, right? Nobody thought about it. Today, it's, today it's better because not just me, but a lot of us in the industry have done a lot of work. And I think legislators broadly, you know, um, uh, you know, the business community understands it, but we still have more work to do. So a lot of our effort is in Washington and otherwise to make sure people understand the breadth and depth and, of the impact and the power, um, the positive impact and power of travel and tourism. And then it's on very specific things to make the pie bigger. It's like getting visa, Jeff will talk about it, a few of them, visa wait times down, which we're working very closely with the Biden administration on, and they are doing really good work. I give them a lot of credit. We were getting up to, in a lot of markets, five, 600 days in, in wait times out of markets like India and Brazil and a whole bunch of other big destination market, so that's important. What happens at the border? That we have a, an experience that is welcoming, hospitable. I know a little bit about you know, being hospitable in the business I'm in, that they, you don't have these long wait times, so that's technology, that's staffing, um, those sorts of things. And then once they're in the country, how do you get them around? How do you make sure that you have the, the destinations are protected and promoted so that pe when people come here, they have places to go and they know where to go, that you have the infrastructure, right? We just passed a $1.3 trillion infrastructure bill, you know, during COVID. How do we make sure that we're advocating for our industry that, that when that 1.3 trillion, really it's $1.6 trillion when you add up all the pieces of it, that that gets allocated in a way that the investment is there in not just highways and bridges to get, you know, to get people around, but airports and ports um, you know, and other forms of infrastructure, you know, that, that help our industry. And then the last thing would be workforce. You know, we, you know, we are, it's getting a little bit better, but even pre COVID, we all know in our industry, it's hard to be able to, you know, get the workforce you need to deliver the, the service that, that people want in all parts of the ecosystem. And so working with the administration and advocating for really sensible, 
uh, immigration policy, visa policies to be able to get not only the workforce you know, out of the people that are here, but make sure that we can get the people that we need in the country, even if it's on a temporary basis, to be able to be able to serve our customers. So those are the some of the big things, and I, it's a labor of love. I mean, I had a few people last comment say to me, like, you're a busy guy, why would you do that? Um, like, why'd you do WTTC? Why? And I said, like, if everybody had that attitude, we would, <laughs> we, our industry would really suffer. This industry has done a lot for me. I mean, provided opportunity beyond my wildest dreams as a kid that wanted to get in the industry. And like, I should do everything I can to give back and I should do everything I can to work with others in the industry to advocate for the industry. You know, making the pie bigger is not, a, shouldn't be a competitive exercise. That helps everybody. Now, what, how that pie gets allocated, I, you know, I'm fiercely competitive about the pie. <laughs> Where the slices go, I want Hilton to have a bigger slice than our competition. But making the pie as big as we can, I think, is in everybody's interest, and we should all do our part. Yeah, uh, when, you, when you say that, it just makes me realize that I wish there were more people in public service who were sort of as eloquent and strategic thinking as the Christmas that is of the world. We would be in a little bit of a better place, perhaps. Um, Doubtful. <laughs> Doubtful if you had me in public service. But, but I would say I'm from Washington, D.C. Not so, you're in Northern Virginia. So yeah, I'm in D.C. here. I'm born and raised. And, and Other than a three years I was in Beverly Hills which my wife affectionately calls our Beverly Hillbilly days. Beverly Hillbilly days, <laughs> I love that. Um, I, uh, I, in DC, as you know, we have sort of a local saying, which is that um, if you don't have a seat at the table, that means you're probably on the menu. Yes. And, and so it's, it's reassuring to hear that US travel has sort of is getting a seat at the table. I'd like to do one more indeed, regulatory. Indeed they are. And Jeff, you'll, if you're here tomorrow, he's an extraordinary executive. He does all the real work. <laughs> I help provide some strategic guidance and obviously I have a lot of connections uh, in, in DC and otherwise that I, that I help as best I can with. But Jeff's a really great leader. One regulatory issue before we move on. So mandatory fees for uh, at hotels, how they're displayed. How would you like to see that issue evolve? Listen, as, as you reported on in the last yeah. couple of weeks, the, the we... The skip that a team has been covering. Yeah, your, your team reported on that, you know, we're going we're gonna to give total transparency. We, you know, we had given transparency. We we're going to go over and above. And a bunch of our competitors um, have been doing the same thing. In the end, we, we don't want consumers confused about what they're buying or what they're paying for what they're buying. There, there's no advantage. The issue in our industry, though, is complicated, okay, because... You know, we tend to sometimes, you know, be our own worst enemy. You have different people doing different things. Now, most of like in the hotel space, most of us are, are sort of are going to the right place. But the, but the problem is a lot of our products are distributed through third-party distribution channels. You're going to have some of them here tomorrow. So whoever is talking to Peter and others, uh, actually Peter's terrific, and ultimately I think they have a very constructive view, but the OTAs and, and more importantly, MetaSearch, um, we all have to be on the same place. It doesn't really matter if Hilton shows it the right way, but because everybody, not everybody, but a large component of the population is starting in Google to do comparison shopping and so they're going to get, if, if there's a belief that it's misleading, they're going to get misled before they ever get anywhere near us. So my view is even playing field. If you're going to, the product is the product, and no matter where it gets distributed, it should be displayed the same way. And so we need, there is legislation. Amy Klobuchar, uh, who, run, who leads the co-leader of the Travel Caucus in the Senate, has proposed along with a lot of others that would do this. We are super supportive of that. I don't know in the world we're living in uh, in DC right now with so much swirl that that you know, is gonna be a top priority, but I, I hope it would be. The administration has obviously been focused on this. I mean, it was in the President's State of the Union address. I would say that suggests a decent amount of focus. Um, and so what we need is either through legislation or just all of the other platforms kind of doing what we've done, which is just do the right thing, do what's right by customers. We need everybody in the same place. Um, and so we are, 
going to continue to advocate. We're, gonna, we've, we're already in the process of doing it ourselves, but we're going to continue to advocate to say, make it, make it consistent across. All, if it's the product, no matter where it shows up, should be displayed consistently. OK. So you're a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. You like data. Um, I'm a reporter. I like anic data, sort of like <laughs> little anecdotes that are kind of like data. Um, and it feels like right now that there's this moment where um, it feels like we're re reaching peak alternative accommodations in a sense, in, not in terms of hard numbers of bookings or share, but in terms of momentum and uh, the mojo of it. And, and it seems like hotel is getting its cool factor back to a certain extent. Would you agree that we're sort of, we've kind of hit peak alternative accommodation? In terms I of don't, I haven't, I, I don't know, okay. I mean, I do like data, as you point out. I just don't have all that data set in my head. I will say this, and, I, and I've been saying this for 10 years, and I'm not always right, I'm not that guy, but I have been right on this, and you and I have talked about this, which is, you know, all, all the accommodations is just a different thing, and so, I, you know, I, I mean, obviously, as that business was growing and, and it was a nascent business, they were going to have a skyrocketing growth as they um, created efficiency in a business that had been around for time and eternity, but that was highly inefficient. And so, like any industry like that that is creating that kind of scale of efficiency, you are definitely going to plateau at some point. So that probably, I don't have the data, so I'm not going to say it has to be happening or plateauing at some level, whether it's flatlining, the growth rate clearly at some point has to come down, and I suspect it is. But in the end, what they do and what we do are different. I mean, I, I mean, I like to hear you say the hotel's getting its cool factor back. I don't think we ever really lost it. I mean, I sat, I'll give you an example. I sat three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago, um, I do this, I, I love focus groups. Hopefully, you, maybe some of you guys have been been uh, behind the behind the glass, but I do them all the time. I my, I drive my team crazy because I like people, and I feel like I can't really understand data purely through data. I need body language. I need what are people's eyes? You know, how are they gesticulating? Like, there's just so much more to the story. And so, we I sat for 12 hours over three days. Uh, and nights, because you know a lot of those get done at night with customers of all segments, all ages, every demographic, everything, you know, asking about things we're doing, competitors are doing, and all the accommodations, right? Um, because I'm super intellectually curious. I have a strong view, okay, but as I get a little more mature, I realize strong view doesn't always mean the right view. That just means it's a strong, you know, I've always had strong opinions, but now I'm a little bit more sensible about understanding sometimes those are gonna be wrong, and you know, sort of trust your instincts. You know, I think it was Ronald Reagan said, "Trust but verify." Trust but verify. Trust yeah. but verify. Like you know, get real data. And so I sat in all of these um, focus groups, and every single one, all demographics, all age groups. Obviously, younger index more to it. But like everybody had, had used it or has a view on it. I mean, they supported hook, line, and sinker. My historical view which is these are different businesses. They're both in the travel in, in the travel ecosystem, but what we do and what they do are different. The stay occasion, the, 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 the need they are fulfilling is very different um, than the need we're fulfilling. They are fulfilling generally for groups, you know, larger groups, long, you know, more extended stay, where people need a facility like a kitchen, where they're looking for a real value proposition because they have a group of people and every you know people are of different means, um, and it's generally more leisure, almost all leisure, leisure related, uh, and a lot of weekend business. What we do is something totally different. We're taking a product, which hopefully we do most, if not all the time, well, that is consistent, high quality, clean wrapping it with great service, real service, people that are trained, they're not hosts that pop in and out, but these people do this for a living, wrapping it with loyalty technology, and, and people pay a premium for that because if they're going somewhere and they're on a business trip, they, they want the reliability, they want the amenities, they want the friendly service that almost all the time is gonna be very good or, or great, right? Like we screw up sometimes, I get that, 
but we get it right. We serve 250 million people a year. I get a lot of complaints, but I get a lot more, I get plenty of letters praising the team, uh, our team's work, and we get it right all, most of the time. And so people pay a premium for that. So I don't even, I don't think we ever lost our cool. Now this is, I'm not gonna pick on the media. I think that the sharing economy thing became pop culture. It's like anything sharing economy was one of those things that just sucked the, sucked the oxygen out of the room. But if you talk to our customers, just like I did three or four weeks ago, five years ago, you know, three years ago, five years ago, seven years ago, they said the same thing. I, I, had, I had a group of our, uh, of our interns together, I had 150 interns, you know, college, graduate school age, I said, you know, how many of you have used Airbnb or one of the home sharing, and like most of the hands went up, I said, so how many of you would prefer it? Like you, you, you know, you're going on a business trip, even if it's gonna turn into leisure, how many of you prefer it? Not one hand went up. Not one? Not one hand went up. Huh. So by the way, that's a limited data set. But the point being, I'm not, by the way, because I know this is live stream and tape, I think Airbnb and the VR, Verbo and all that, those are, those are, you know, those, I know all the guys that run those, and I know Brian's gonna be here, those are great businesses. That's not, I'm not saying that they're, you know, that they're not, I mean, they could get a data set of people that would say, that every hand would go up. I'm, my point is they're different. They're satisfying custom, different needs, stay occasions of a customer. And I think what time has, has told us Maybe they're plateauing just because you know the efficiency curve is is flattening out. I don't know. You 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 probably have more uh, data, but but what I do know is that there is enough room for both of us to really succeed, and that is I think testament to that. The evidence of that is in the data. Like they they we're not seeing any cannibalization. We're not seeing like people adopt like all of a sudden they're traveling for you know, for business and, they, and they've ad abandoned hotels and they want to stay in, in all to accommodate. It's just not happening. And I, and I don't think, I think a little bit of, of those kinds of things is always going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen on mass. I think when it happens is because of the value proposition. I think it's when, it's when it becomes a value trade. It's like, well, I can't afford the price to get the consistency and the service and the amenities and the lo all those things. And so, I effectively have to accept the higher beta experience to get a better value. That's when it happens. That makes sense. Well, I want to get into Hyatt's, excuse me, Hilton's brands here. If we could call the image for Spark. Hyatt! Oh, no, I know, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's right. I saw Mark's going to be here. Mark's a great guy. He's one of my best pals in the industry. Uh, I hope he would say the same tomorrow when he's here. <laughs> if he doesn't, let me know, will you? <laughs> Tell him I said he's a good guy. Uh, you launched two brands this year, a we spark, did. spark by Hilton and then an extended stay brand. Um, you've talked a lot about a segmentation being very important for you when you think about branding. How do you incubate brands today? Listen, we have, uh, we, again, we're, I'm going to always start by saying we're not, we're not perfect because we're not. Um, but we do some things really well. And I think developing, launching, and scaling brands, we do better than anybody in the industry. When, you know, when I got to the company, 16 years ago, time flies. We had nine brands, we have 22 brands, and you know, assume that we have at least one, one or two always up our sleeve, nothing to announce here today. Um, the latest two you know, are, are products of that muscle set that we built, which is really driven around what you'd expect it to be, all these crazy focus groups and things I do, and research, you know, quant and qual research that we do, talking you know, to loyalty members, talking to our customers, our non-customers. It's all about trying to figure out like, how do we continue to build a bigger, better network effect? Who are we serving well? Who are we not serving? Or is it because you know, we're not in a certain geography, or in the case of brands, or do we not have a, a product that meets the market from the standpoint of price point or stay occasion? And Spark and affectionately Project H3, we will have a name in the next few weeks. It takes a long time to get IP these days uh, in Washington. But those are examples of, of each of those things. So Spark is a great example of we, the biggest segment in demand in the United States, and for that matter, in most jurisdictions in the world, is economy. We're not in that space, because we never really had figured out how to do it 
and, and deliver a consistent product, be able to afford to have the service levels that we need that we think are in keeping with being in the Hilton family. And so what's different now is we figured it out. We figured it out a little bit before COVID and then during COVID we leaned in hard and we really figured out how to engineer a 100% conversion brand that would touch every element of the customer facing experience, both the service delivery, but all of the physical product. You have a picture of it up on the screen. The first one opened in Mystic, Connecticut last week. I'll be there next week to do an open, or week after next to do the opening of that. I believe it will be the most disruptive. It is not, and my team hates when I say this, they get really pissed at me, but it is not the sexiest thing that we're doing, and, but it is the most disruptive thing we've done. Why? Because nobody, I mean, if you go around, and I'm not gonna pick on individual companies in the, in the economy space, we, we view, our, we're at the very high end, so we call it premium economy. We like making up categories, but it is at the very high end of economy. There's no consistency. There's not a brand, it's just not the way it works. It, it, you have a bunch of collections of very, and sometimes very large collections of hotels that are just old and haven't been renovated. To get into the Hilton system, you have to do 100% and we're gonna do it for you. You're gonna buy it through us and we're gonna make sure it's done exactly the right way so that it's a, every product you will walk into will be fresh. In that way, at that price point, which thinking about US terms is sort of like 80 to $90, um, we will be very unique in, in the space. Why do I like it? Because we're gonna, we're gonna then serve a, tens of millions of incremental customers that we're not serving today. And a lot of them are young, a lot of them are middle-aged, some are old, but there's a whole bunch of young people and a whole bunch of customers broadly that we'll bring in and they will start staying in our other brands and move around. H3 is just a product thing. It's not like a price point. It's, you know, it's really for a more mobile workforce. Um, and that is like micro apartment, you know, meets hotel. I would argue it's more of an apartment, uh, apartment efficiency than it is hotel. And there's just nobody that's done that at scale. So that is less about the, there is a price point associated with it, but it's a very specific product that is not, that's out there in the market in a very small way in little pockets. But what we do really well is do it, we think better, and then we do it at scale. So that, you know, as, as you have all these workforce needs all around the country um, that, you know, where people aren't gonna be there for, you know, multiple years, they don't wanna sign one year leases, but they need an apartment to work and live, we're gonna give them that option. Cool. Uh, in a moment, we're gonna to go to audience Q&A and Rafit will uh, it, kick us off, but I wanted just to pick on that one point of that the, both of those brands that I noticed are sort of what I would consider middle-class brands, that, you know, and you said in your August uh, mid -tier, call, yeah. mid-tier, you called them, the, the big opportunity for Hilton for the next 10, possibly 20 years is in the mid-market. Not that you're gonna yep. neglect luxury, but um, we're never gonna, we love luxury. I mean, I love I luxury. Know. I bet everybody in the room sure. will say, I love luxury, I love lifestyle. We're doing all that. And we have a huge amount of effort and we've launched a bunch of brands um, in, in the space. We're the fastest growing luxury brands on earth, you know, with Waldorf and Conrad and LXR. But what you've heard me say publicly, and I'm happy to say it here, because I know it, I am confident I will be right. The opportunity on a global basis for growth over the next 10, 20, 30 years is in the mid-market. Why is that? It's obvious, because that's where the growth demographically is, is in the middle class, and what can middle class customers afford? Mid-market products, whether it's hotels or anything else. So when you wake up in 10 or 20 years and look at X number of millions of rooms were built over that time frame around the world, they were going to disproportionately be in the mid-market. We think we have the best mid-market brands, and we are extending those at a very rapid pace all around the world to serve those customers. Then guess what? Those customers grow up, many of them, they become you know, upper middle class and beyond, and they stay in all sorts of our other brands um, you know, at, at higher price points. So I believe to build a real network effect. My attitude is we wanna serve every customer for any need they have anywhere in the world they wanna be, it, the bulk of it, that neural network is in the mid-market. And the rest of it then gets connected to that 
network. That makes sense. So more often than not, the next brands that will be coming from uh, Hilton will be sort of in the mid-market. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I've talked publicly. My, my guess, not necessarily. I mean, we have other yeah, things. Tell me. Tell me more. No, I, I, I think I've, I know I've said publicly. We're looking at luxury lifestyle. We, okay. That is something we have it a bit, you know, with LXR as a, a luxury collection brand that has luxury lifestyle. If we don't have a hard luxury lifestyle brand, then we're working on one. I don't. Not, I don't know when we'll do it. I, I, I legitimate, legitimately don't know when. I'm not ho holding back on you. Okay. But I would say in the next year or two, we'll do something in that space. So that's probably the next thing we'll do. OK. All right. Um, if we have, I guess we can go to audience questions. Rafit, are you? you yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Chris, I have a question for you. So have you played with uh, chat GPT? A little bit. I've had people send me things like ask questions about me and send me the result. Um, <laughs> Probably mostly wrong. Which made me, which made me believe there's still a ways to go. But um, <laughs> yes, I have played with it. Our team a little bit. Our team has definitely played with it. So my question, I guess, a follow-up question was, does it yet come up at the board level? Are, are you thinking about generative AI um, or uh, or any uses of it across long term at the board level? That's sort of the question that I've been. Yes, I mean, we, we listen, we've been using AI for, in one form or another, for many years. And um, chat GPT, generative AI, is obviously the next step in the evolution. Somebody was on CNBC, oh, I think it was Barry Diller um, this morning. And I, I know Barry not real well, but I know him. And I agreed. He was like, AI, AI, AI. You know, it's like it's all anybody wants to talk about. Um, and um, what I would say is, um, I think Bill Gates said this, I think, you know, a lot of the transformation technologically over the long term will have a lot more impact on the world than we think sitting here today, but in the short term will have less impact. I think AI, generative AI falls in that category. I think when we wake up in 10 or 20 years, it'll be revolutionary in a whole bunch of different ways, but I think it's going to take time. And my personal experience with it so far and our team's experience with it is we have a long way to go before it's you know in that form super productive but ai has tremendous application already not chat gpt directly but ai and we're already as i said using it in really powerful ways so what you know i think it's not there yet but i think one of the most powerful applications for travel and tour tourism is going to be like your digital concierge. I mean, at some point, like, you go, you know, like, how you market your product, you know, is going to be through generative AI. Like, if you don't show up there, if you don't have the content that shows up in a way where it spits out, go stay at a hill, you want to go to the Maldives, go to the Waldorf Astoria in the Maldives, you're in trouble. So, it, I think it will revolutionize eventually the way you go to market, right? So, I think, so kind of a search engine optimization for? I, I, think, I think it will completely change the landscape. What do I think is required? I think it's true today, more and more content, right? I think having an amazing, which we think we do and are continuing to build, having, having an amazing content strategy so you make sure no matter where it goes, you're the one showing up is going to be important. I, the, area, the other area that we're using it, you know, aggressively right now is think about it. It's like where do you have like massive amounts of data that you know that you that you can use AI to sort of sort intelligently to to get better insights. So in the in our customer insights team, it's amazing. I mean, I was kidding. You know, we we you know like if you wanted to ask me like what are the top three things that people are complaining about in hotels in the world. You know, we can, you know, through AI, we can tell you that. We can get structured, unstructured data out of our systems, out of our messaging platforms, out of social media, like stuff we could never do before. How do we do it? It's AI. AI will, allows us to scrape the whole universe and be able to tell us what's really going on. So what does that allow us to do? That allows us to, you know, much more thoughtfully address problems with customers, customize experiences, at scale, you know, um, you know, to individual customers, it allows us to resolve problems because we can 
you know, we can, through the, you know, the ability to pick up all the data unstructured and structured, we can, you know, we can, we can respond to people's issues in the moment instead of like historically, like, we're sorry, here's a bunch of Hilton Honors points because we screwed up. How about we fix it in the moment? You know, you know, AI allows you now to have a lot more listening posts out there and to have a mechanism for picking up with that. And then there's some rudimentary stuff. Think about people management, financial management, like gobs and gobs of data, um, lots of ones and zeros, and things that you can do in those areas with the use of AI that can make, you know, that can make that much simpler, much more straightforward. And, uh, and you, can do, you, know, you can do it faster and, and better on people management and financial management. So we, we already use it in, in the HR area aggressively. We use, it in, in, uh, we use it in the financial management area aggressively. We, look, we use it aggressively in how we screen candidates and a whole bunch of the, uh, different areas that are really fun. So, you know, it, and it'll keep building, building steam. Um, I don't think you're gonna see it, you know, I think it'll take some time. Yeah, but it'll be. Re I think we, ten years when I'm. If if you guys invite me back in ten years, I think we'll look back and say it took some time, but it's pretty revolutionary, and a bunch of things are very different as a result of it. Okay. Uh, audience question: How do you expect Expedia's new loyalty program, One Key, to impact well-established programs like Hilton Honors? I listen. Peter will have a view on that tomorrow when he's here. Um, Peter and I are friends. I, I mean, we, we're not worried about it. I mean, I, I, I think of, in a very grossly simplistic way, as um, our job is the experience, is fulfillment. So if you look at, you know, there's two ends of the poles, there's the platforms, you know, and increasingly, whether those can be the OTAs or Google or Apple or Amazon or whatever the big platforms are, people are buying tons and tons of their stuff through these platforms around the world. There are different platforms in China and Europe and here, but you have these mega platforms. And everybody, for ease, we, you know, just, we want to do it, we want to do it on our phone, we want to make life easy. So much is funneled through there. But the way that we believe we fight against commoditization broadly or, you know, threats from, you know, an Expedia loyalty program or, or otherwise, is just being really, really good at fulfillment. So when it comes down to it, at Hilton, if we provide you with the best product, most consistently, with the best service, the friendliest service, have killer tech that makes your life really easy, takes friction out, gives you, you know, a delight, you know, that, that um, ultimately, you're going to want our products. You're going to stay with us. We're going to, it's going to drive our, our market share and our business and, and, and our success. And no matter where you're buying stuff, you're going to want to find us if we do a good job. And the platforms are going to need us because they all want the best products. So the way I think about it is we're in the business of fulfillment. That's what we do. The business of making you know the experience and giving you the platform, I like to say, like, your, uh, our stage, your story, we create the backdrop for you to do whatever you want to do. We do it better than anybody else. Um, and, it's, and, and, and as a result, we, we get a premium. I mean, right now, our brands have the highest premium on average of anybody in the industry. Because I think, I hope, you as customers, some of you certainly are, uh, I would hope, um, that we do it better and people pay a premium. So we want to remain the premium player by executing better and better. We know coming out of COVID, by the way, that we have a ways to go. Like that, you know, there are all sorts of, we had supply chain issues, we had issues getting labor, we get all that, and we're not through that yet. And so there have been some quality issues in the industry, and we've had them too, and service issues, and, and cleanliness issues, and things, and we're all over that. We're, we're in a big, big push and campaign globally on, you know, back to basics. We call it our customer promise to be the most reliable, friendly hospitality company on earth. But that starts with back to basics and giving customers what they want, man done maniacally well, consistently, all the time. And if we just focus on being the best at fulfillment, we, we don't worry about what Peter's doing. I don't worry about what Google's doing. I don't worry about what 
anybody's doing because you guys will all want to find us. And any platform, whoever is out there, is going to want us on the platform because if people want it, they want it there. So I know that's a gross oversimplification, but I think sometimes it's easy as a CEO or whatever leader to get caught up in like every little shiny object, every little thing that's going on and not see the forest through the trees. And so I learned a long time ago, and you know, like early days, one of my great professors in business school, it's like know the business you're in, like really define it, know, know it well and execute it flawlessly and there'll be a place for you as long as the product is something that you think people will want. And I think experiences are something people are going to want. They're not, you're, you guys aren't going to start wearing headsets and banging around your apartments, right? It ain't ever going to happen. So they're going to want what we do, and if we do it better, we're going to be in really good shape. So my whole focus right now is back to basics, cut the promise that we make to our customer, and just really grinding hard to get it right, every little thing. Well, it's been our stage, but your story would help me. Thank you very much, Tristan. Yeah, Enjoyed great this to be here. Thank you, guys.